thanks very much for the introductions and thanks to the organizer for inviting me to this wonderful workshop. So I'm not sure my talk will, be, will fit into the, the frontiers in uh, non equilibrium quantum materials, but uh, it's try to address actually uh, older questions where whether or not you can realize an ideal well same metals in, in, in three dimension, which um, Claudia was uh, discussing uh, yesterday. So uh, the goal of this talk is to try to convince you that through a series of quantum oscillation measurements, uh, we're able to map the Fermi surface of uh, this type of band structure, an ideal type two well same metals, and we can map uh, the evolution of the Fermi surface going from hole to electrons as it crossing the well points. And then there are some really interesting consequences uh, um, coming from this uh, type of band structure where you see a singularity response in the anonymous hole as you change the chemical potential. So let me first uh, uh, acknowledge the uh, person who actually did this work. So this work is really primarily driven by uh, my uh, former student, uh, Chen Yi Zhang. She is now just left to Stanford uh, last month as a Glenn postdoc fellow working for uh, Aaron Capitonic and Ian Fisher. And we also got a lot of UW uh, theory supports from uh, Di Xiao and his postdoc, uh, Chong Wang. And uh, a lot of this experiments is done in the high field magnet labs, which we got uh, excellent user supports from uh, staff scientists. And this work cannot be done uh, with, uh, without the funding supports from these agencies. Okay, so. Claudia has already given very nice introductions about the uh, topological phase of matters and wells and metals. So I really just want to highlight a few important points about wells and metals. So uh, in materials where you have broken time reversal or inversion symmetries, then you have uh, non-degenerate bands and then which can cross in some parts, uh, in some point in the momentous space where the uh, dispersion is described by these well equations. So these well points can be thought of as the uh, monopole of the uh, uh, Barry curvatures, and or, or or you can say it's a source or sinks of the Barry flux, uh, depends on the chirality of this uh, wild points. And then one important consequence of that is that you you actually get a uh, Fermi arc surface states, which has been uh, discovered very early on um, uh, since the proposal of the wild uh, same metals. And uh, perhaps more um, um, more subtly or more 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 difficult to to detect is the transport uh, uh, a property associated with wild and metal. So uh, Claudia has already uh, talked a lot about this uh, chiral anomalies where when you have a magnetic field and electric field aligned together, you'll see your, your uh, generates a, uh, a chiral occurrence which will lead to a large um, negative magnetic resistance. Although there's a lot of uh, controversy associated with the interpretation of this result, but more or less this has been observed in uh, um, uh, the class of materials. Uh, <coughs> Uh, that can broadly define as topological semi-metals. Another very interesting effect associated with the transport <coughs> effect associated with this wild same metal is this uh, intrinsic anomalous hole effect, which is the statement is that if you can tune the frame level exactly at wild points, um, and this will actually give you a topological hole response that uh, the hole conductivity is just e squared over h times the separation of wild nodes. So in some sense, this is like a 3D analog of the quantum hole effect, which each uh, kx, ky session between these wild points will give you a e square of h uh, quantized hole conductance. So this has never been observed, and then really you know, nothing close to, to, to seeing something similar uh, uh, at this point. The other thing I want to mention is that there's two kinds of wild same metals. Uh, there's type one and type two. So unlike the high energy um, physics analogs where you, know, you have Lorentz uh, symmetry, in the solids, you can actually tilt the well cones in the energy momentum space. So if the tilting gets too large so that along some directions, the, the, you actually have energy decrease as you increase momentum, then it becomes a type two wild cement metals. So those two type of wild cement metals has very different uh, Fermi surface topology. So if you have a type one wild cement metals, you know, the conventional one uh, with little tilting, you have, um, you have a, a, a peanut shape uh, Fermi surface when you are above this uh, lift sheet energies. So basically you have a Fermi surface enclosing both wild points and then eventually separates to two electron pockets uh, that in each enclosing a wild point and then they shrink to uh, a point when you exactly at the uh, wild points and then uh, when you go to the whole side, you know, same thing happens, uh, except now you have whole pockets. Whereas for the type two wild cement metal, because now it is tilted, so 
even if your Fermi level is exactly at the well points, you have coexistence of the electron hole pockets, and then they are connected at the well points. Okay, so what I present you are really a uh, theorist uh, ideal. You know, when they proposing all, all this uh, very um, interesting phenomenon like chiral anomalies, like one eyes uh, non hole effect, or even more recently some of these um, light matter interactions. What they, are picture, what, they, what they have in mind is a picture of something like this, where you just have two wild points and then two uh, a conduction and valence band crossing each other, and nothing else. But in reality, most of the wild semimetals we discovered so far are really a mess. You know, for example, like this is the most uh, well-known magnetic wild semimetals, cobalt-3, tin-2, sulfur-2, and then they are, uh, you can see that there's just multiple bands, and then you have uh, more than a dozen of Fermi pockets, and then some wild points are above the Fermi level, some wild points are below the Fermi level, and there are some other energy bands, trivial energy bands crossing the Fermi level. So we really want to have something like this in experiments and to really test these uh, excellent ideas proposed by the theorist. So an early theoretical proposal for realizing a wild semimental uh, was proposed by Birkhoff and Leon Balance which is you simply just grow a super lattice of topological insulator and ferromagnetic yeah. insulator, where the ferromagnetic insulator is sandwiched between the topological insulator. And um, so therefore the ferromagnet provides you the time reversal symmetry breaking and depends on the uh, coupling strain between this surface state and this surface state or this surface state and this surface states. You have a phase diagram where uh, uh, when the carbon strand is uh, uh, tuned uh, um, to the right regime, you know, measured in the units of the exchange gap uh, induced by the ferromagnetic uh, 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 interactions on the uh, surface states, then you can stabilize the wild same metal phase. So uh, recently there is a material that uh, Su Yang has already talked about, which is the manganese bismuth telluride. It's actually a natural uh, crystal realization of this super lattice. So this is a van der Waal layer magnet where each layer is formed by this manganese bismuth uh, tellurium uh, layer. So you can think of it as a manganese tellurium uh, sandwiched by the uh, two bismuth uh, 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 tellurite, which is also a canonical topological insulator. These manganese moments, they order ferromagnetic within the plane, and then they have the outer plane, uh, magnetic easy and isotropy and um, easy access. And uh, when you stack together, they actually form a A-type anti-ferromagnet orders where the uh, ferromagnet plane anti align from one layer to the other. Okay, so we're very close to this uh, wonderful model uh, proposed by, by Birkhoff and uh, Leon Balance, uh, uh, except that we just need to turn it into the ferromagnetic phase. And then this, you can do that by applying magnetic field. So, for example, here, this is the resistance as a function of field, and then you can see this sudden jump, this corresponding to the uh, uh, spin flop fields, and then you can keep counting the, the, the moments, and eventually the, the uh, uh, moment saturates, and then you enter into the going from antiferromagnetic phase to counting antiferromagnetic phase, eventually to the paramagnetic or ferromagnetic phase. So therefore, you, you do have a, a, a natural crystal that, that just looks like this very simple realization of Wilson mantle that I proposed uh, almost a decade ago. So indeed, once uh, soon after the discovery of these materials, you know, people calculate the band structure of these um, uh, in the ferromagnetic phase uh, of manganese bismuth telluride, and then they, they realize that oh, it's actually uh, a ideal Wilson mantle with only two wild points um, in the um, near the Fermi levels, and then nothing else, no no other energy bands crossing the Fermi mm -hmm. level. So, but um, uh, a caveat is that the calculation actually um, uh, is a bit um, controversial in the sense that for one group, they get a type 2 wild semimetals, and then for the other groups, they get a trivial semiconductor where the energy band doesn't really cross. And then, but with a slight adjustment of the lattice parameter, you can get either a type 2 wild semimetals or type 1 wild semimetals. So the, the true ground state of this system, or the true electronic state of this system is really not yet... Um, <coughs> Uh, not, not fully resolved. Um, and uh, traditionally, this type of question is being uh, answered by a RPS measurement where you can directly measure the energy bands of, uh, of the materials. But uh, because of this <coughs> magnetic field you require to induce the ferromagnetic phase, 
then that basically makes the RPS measurement impossible because RPS just um, cannot be measured under a magnetic field. The electrons will uh, circulate around once, the, once it leaves the materials. So our solution to this problem is that we're going to use the quantum oscillation to probe the electron structures in the field induced ferromagnetic magnetic phase. So to give you a very quick introduction of the idea of this quantum oscillation is that when you apply magnetic fields in the solids, you form Landau levels, and then when you're sweeping the magnetic field, the Landau level spacing changes, and then therefore, uh, when the chemical potential is fixed, then you will see a series of oscillations. That tells you about the electronic structure and the, uh, the, the, uh, the size of the Fermi surface. So essentially, you'll see these oscillations that uh, is periodic in 1 over B, and then that frequency corresponding to the area of the uh, Fermi surface if it's two dimension. But if it's three dimension, that corresponding to the maximum of the cross section area of the Fermi surface projected along the directions of the magnetic field. Okay. You can also get uh, the effective mass by measuring temperature dependence, but we won't really go into that uh, for, for, for the purpose of this talk. So how do you use this, do you, how do you use this idea to, 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 to probe the trans structure of the wild mantle? So if you look at the uh, bend dispersion and the associated Fermi surface with this three possibility. You have normal semiconductor, you have type one wild sand mantles, you have type two wild sand mantle. They each have a different kind of Fermi surface as you tune from electron to hole. Right, so for uh, trivial semiconductor, you have this um, uh, ellipsoidal Fermi surface where you only have a maximum, one, one uh, possible uh, um, uh, ex uh, extremal uh, formula, uh, um, uh, areas when you are applying magnetic field along this direction. <coughs> so you will see one frequency. However, if it's, if it's a type 1 Wilson mantle, so then this is uh, uh, when you apply magnetic field along these KZ directions, then there's actually two, two extremal. So you have a minimum and then you also have a maximum. So both will give rise to the quantum oscillation frequency. So we'll see two frequencies. In the oscillation, and then eventually, if you're getting closer to the wild points, and then you have this separate uh, electron pockets, it will turn into a, a single frequency, and then the same thing goes with the whole uh, whole side. And then in the case of type two, you will have more complicated evolutions, and then you also will see uh, two frequency when you are near the wild points because now you have uh, electron pockets and two electron pockets and, and the whole pockets. Okay, so so basically the idea is that. If you can tune the chemical potential of the system and then map the frequency, which tells you the topology of your Fermi surface as a function of chemical potential, that should uniquely match into each of these scenarios. So fortunately for manganese bismuth telluride, uh, you can actually tune the carrier type from n-type to p-type by substituting the bismuth with antimony. So even though antimony and bismuth, they are isovalence, uh, uh, what really happens is that even for a pure manganese bismuth telluride compound, the ascron crystal usually are heavily endoped. And this is because there's always a lot of anti-site defects within the crystals. And then when you substitute in bismuth with antimony, somehow it changes this anti-site um, defect uh, populations. And then therefore, going from, you're able to change the karyotypes from n-type to p-type. And then as somewhere around uh, 0.7, you are near the charge neutrality. And if this is a Wilson mantle, then supposedly this is very close to wild points. So we have grown a series of crystals going from uh, uh, n-type to p-type, and then the magnetic state is relatively stable, so you have the same critical fields, and then you can see that the resistance uh, getting an insulating behavior when you are near the charge neutrality, which is a good sign, meaning that you really reduce the carrier by a lot. And then you also see the whole uh, resistivity um, slope changing sign, meaning that you actually change the carrier type from N type to P type. Okay, so let's look at the quantum oscillation. So we went to the high field lab and then applying very large magnetic field and then going deep into the ferromagnetic magnetic phase and then seeing oscillation in series of samples. And then you can uh, um, extract the oscillating components and then do the Fourier transform and then uh, find out the frequency of these oscillations. And then immediately you can see that uh, for these type of samples, you see two peaks corresponding to fre two frequency. And when you go to this point, which is the, so, so from the heavily electron dope to the charge neutrality, all the samples showing two frequency, 
But once you go to the whole site, you have a single frequency oscillation. So when you, see, when you see two frequency, the first question you ask is, is it coming from the two different orbits, uh, maximum or, and, and minimum of a single pocket, or is it coming from the maximums of two separate pockets? So to answer that, you also have to measure the whole effect. So on the left, this is the electron dope samples where show the two frequencies. So you can already see two frequency from the beer oscillation signal, right? You can see that the oscillation amplitude has this beating effect. The amplitude is small and then large and small and then get very large. This is the characteristic of beating uh, of two frequency. But from the whole effect, it's strictly needed. So that means that there's only one type of carriers. Whereas for this sample, this is sample near charge neutrality, the oscillation is uh, uh, weak compared to the uh, magnetic resistance, so it's barely visible here. But trust me, there's two frequency here. Here you're seeing a very nonlinear Hall effect. So this nonlinear Hall effect is a uh, canonical signature of the coexistence of electron hole pocket. So the two frequency here corresponding to the uh, two types of carriers. And then now, once we move to the whole dope site, then you see a single frequency oscillation. You know, the oscillation, uh, 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 both the periods and the amplitude are very regular. And you also see a linear uh, whole resistivity indicating a single type of carrier. So this nonlinearity is actually coming from the uh, anomalous whole effect when you go across this uh, metamagnetic transitions. Uh, but if you actually look at the high field slope, it is uh, linear. So, so there's only one type of carrier. So combining with all this information, now we can determine what is the, the trans structures of these materials. So on the left-hand side, you have two frequency. Uh, in the electron dope side, you have two frequency with, uh, corresponding to one type of uh, uh, carriers or one, one pocket. So that exactly match the electron pockets that has a peanut shape that has a minimum and the maximum. Now, in the charge neutrality, when you see this nonlinear hole effects and uh, coexistence of electron hole pockets, the two frequency corresponding to uh, an electron pockets and two um, whole, uh, two electron pockets and whole pockets. And then finally, when you move into the whole side, now you have these whole pockets in the center of the brain zone, and there's only one uh, uh, maximum here. So that corresponding to to, to, to the single frequency you observe in the, the whole dope sample. So all, all this information basically uniquely determine that the band structure has to be the type 2 one sample zone and can, cannot be uh, anything else. In fact, I mean, the, the fact that we're seeing the coexistence of electron and whole pockets already kind of indicates that it has to be type 2 one sample because all the other scenario doesn't really match the, um, uh, doesn't really, uh, uh, it's not possible to, to have the coexistence of the electron hole carriers. And, uh, and we also did some, some tube band fitting to get the carrier density of the electron hole from the whole resistivity measurements. It actually match with the um, uh, frequ two frequency we see in, in this type of samples. Okay, so now, now we have determined the band structure. Then we can ask a question. So what is the observable consequence of a ideal type two water sample? So now I want to return to this uh, this idea of this uh, quantized whole uh, uh, response coming from the separation of wild nodes. So when you are exactly at the wild nodes, then you have this um, sigma xy that corresponding to e squared over h times the separations of the wild nodes. Now, uh, um, a question is that if you're uh, moving away from this um, uh, wild points, what would you expect for your whole conductivity? So uh, very early on, uh, uh, Birkhoff actually uh, think about this problem and realized that you, the, the system will actually independent, uh, be independent of the position of chemical potential when this uh, system is a ideal type one wild cementos with no tilting. And the reason is that once you have free carrier, you have to consider the contributions of the um, uh, anomalous whole conductivity from this free carrier, which essentially is integrating over the uh, uh, Z component of the barrier curvature uh, of the occupied states. So remember, this two wild point corresponding to a barrier curvature dipole. 
So if you remember your intro E and M, when you are very close to this dipole, then you basically have uh, the uh, field that is pointing outwards. So if you're averaging over the, this circular space, then the net uh, omega z, uh, the z component bear curvature should be zero. So let me just plot this in the color map where the color map is indicating the z component of a barrier curvature, then you can see that when you have two circular frame surfaces around the wild points, the, 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 the contribution cancels. Now, the situation becomes very different if you have type two wild cementos. In type two wild cementos, you have whole pockets, you know, and the electron pockets um, that, um, that, 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 that is occupying at this different region of your uh, momentum space. So, so, so this whole pocket, the, the, the integration is, um, uh, give you a, a net barrier curvature contribution, which um, if you add with the electron side, you know, which gives you an opposite sign because it's occupied state and the whole give you the unoccupied state's contribution, they, they, they actually add up and then give you a very large free carrier contributions uh, to the anomalous whole conductivity. So, to kind of summarize this result, you can look at this figure, which is measuring the, which is cal uh, calculations of the, uh, a very uh, simple analytical calculations of the anomalous hole conductivity as a function of tilting of the wild cones. So in the center, you're in the type one regime, and then once you pass this uh, unit one, then you're in entering into type two, and you can tilt either um, out or inwards. And this different curve corresponding to different chemical potential. So you can see that if you're not, there's no tilting, then the uh, anomalous hole conductivity is essentially independent of the chemical potential. And then you get some dependence once you have some tilting, but you get a very large dramatic dependence, even switching sign uh, when you go to the type two region, just because of this effect I was talking about where this hole and electron Fermi surface capture all this uh, Z component barrier curvature created by this uh, very dipole. So we measure the anomalous hole effect, which is uh, looking at this jump of the whole resistivity uh, across the meta magnetic transition because at the, in, in the anti-ferrium phase, there's no anomalous hole. The global time symmetry is uh, reserved. So uh, you can see that there is a jump at the meta magnetic transitions and then this value corresponding to the anomalous hole resistivity, which you already you can see that there's a very dramatic change near the charge neutrality. So we convert this to the anomalous hole conductivity and then measure much more samples, then it's very clear that it is showing this uh, heartbeat-like singularity response as the chemical potential tuning from the electron side to the whole side. So this is plotting as a function of the low field carrier density, which is kind of a proxy of the chemical potentials. And this is exactly uh, as you expected uh, uh, for the case of a Type two wild mantle where when you change the chemical potential, the anomalous hole conductivity changes very wildly. And uh, we also did some DFT uh, calculations, which although the value doesn't match, but the qualitative behavior uh, is, uh, is consistent. Okay. Uh, so how much time do I still have? Oh, 10 minutes. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm speaking much faster than I expected. Okay, so then I can, talk about next results much more uh, slowly, which is uh, uh, we can, uh, another question we want to ask is that whether you can induce a type two or type one uh, wild cemental transitions by, by, um, oh, I have zero minutes. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I'm very surprised I have 10 minutes, but. Okay, then, then I won't go through this, uh, this uh, results very, very um, in, in details, but uh, I'll, I'll just give you a summary of the second results, which is um, uh, the system is a type two wild cementals when you have magnetization out of plane in the C axis, but you can switch it to a type one wild cemental by rotating the magnetization. The wild cone, the tilting will rotate with the rotation of magnetizations and then by very carefully analyzing the quantum oscillation as a function of angle, and then as, and also the hole, the two band hole as a function of angles, and the mass hole as a function of angle, we concluded that around maybe 45 or 50 degrees, you have a lift transitions where the whole pocket disappear, and then, um, um, and then you also have some corresponding change of the anomalous hole 
the system probably goes into a type one well cement source by rotating mechanization. Okay, so since I have no time, I'll just leave my summary here and then open for questions. Thank you.